Hello, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to this talk, the topic of which is exploring reactive programming in Java. My name is Miro Tsutak, and I'm with a Toronto-based company called DNA Stack. Our mission at DNA Stack is to improve lives of people affected by genetic disease, and we do it by making standards and technologies for discovery, sharing, and analysis of biomedical data. And if health tech is something you're interested in or curious about in general, feel free to reach out to me. I'm very passionate about the topic and always happy to connect and talk about it. If you want to reach out, here's my Twitter handle in the corner here. In this session, we're not focusing on the domain. We're focusing on the underlying technology stack, which in our case is, of course, Java and how to be reactive with it. So let me just start by saying that reactive programming is pretty great. What I don't like about it, however, is that it became a buzzword. It's often described as the standalone, completely novel paradigm, and I don't think that's too grandiose of a term in this case. But in reality, reactive programming is not new. As a methodology, it's a collection of principles that individually have been around for a very long time. And as a technology, it's also built on top of existing technologies that have been around for many years. The magic happens when we combine these existing things in a particular way. And I think this sort of larger context is an aspect of reactive programming that's often overlooked, yet it's very useful to help us understand the essence of it. At DNA Stack, we started doing reactive a couple of years ago, and we've certainly seen a few people struggle with this model. It's complex and not exactly easy to pick up. But I'm hoping that this kind of broader conceptual talk can help with the understanding of basic principles, provide the background of things, if you will. So this is going to be a slightly different kind of reactive talk in that in the next 45 minutes or so, I'm not going to talk about a particular reactive library or a framework. Instead, I'm going to go over the building blocks of reactive systems, which are available in the JDK right now. I'm going to take you through what I call nine levels of reactive, which correspond to features in the JDK in the order they were added to Java, but also, not incidentally, in the order that corresponds to how advanced your reactive system is. But before we get to that, let me start by clarifying what it means to be reactive. Reactive is all about responding to change. The term refers to the ability of the system to respond to events as they happen. So it's basically a cool name for a collection of practices for creating systems that are responsive. And to get to responsive, we need to be elastic, we need to be able to handle varying workload and numbers of users, and we need to be resilient to failure. We need to be able to contain the failures, and it's okay to respond with an error, but we need to be able to handle it in a reasonable and controlled way. And as it turns out, being message-driven, particularly when it comes to asynchronous messaging, is what allows us to be elastic and resilient. These four properties, responsive, elastic, resilient, and message-driven, this is the foundation of reactive systems. That's what it's all about. And I think that's enough slides. Let's jump straight to code. I like learning through examples, so I'm going to write a lot of them. And I'm going to write them in JShell. So let me switch to my terminal here, and let's take a look at the first feature. On our journey through the history and levels of reactive, let's start really far in the past with the very first version of Java, Java 1. Reactive programming is a particular take on parallelism. And since the very first version of Java, we've had basic constructs for parallelism, namely the runnable interface and its implementation thread. So we could easily do something like this. I'll just create a new thread here which uh, takes a runnable, as we can see here. So let's just do a quick lambda. I'm just going to print out a string that I like. Let's say something like this, hello j4k, and let's call this thread t. And then I can start the thread, and you can see that it prints the correct value. And that's very nice, right? This was a big deal at the time because we had this abstraction in the JDK, so we no longer had to write native code to handle threads. But it was pretty much all we could do with threads at the time. I mean, you could group them and stuff, but there were no sophisticated mechanisms for coordinating them. So I'm going to call this level zero reactive. If we're using threads, we're paralyzed, which is a necessary first step towards reactive, but it's obviously very far from a reactive system. You shouldn't try to build a reactive system on top of threads directly. It's a low-level primitive, threads are very heavyweight, and there's simply too much other stuff that you would have to implement yourself to actually have a reactive system if you just started with this. But things got a bit more real with Java 5. Java 5 introduced three interesting interfaces. It introduced executor service, it introduced callable, and it introduced future. Executor service is a framework for execution of tasks, in other words, runnables. So in practice, we're talking thread pools. Callable is kind of like an runnable in that it's a representation of a task, but it's a task that returns a result or may throw an exception. And future is a future result of an asynchronous computation. 
And this is how they work together. I can create a new executor service. Let's say just a single threaded one. So I'm just going to use executors new single thread executor. And let's call this E. I can use this executor to submit a task, which requires a callable, pretty unsurprisingly. So again, just a quick lambda here. I'm just going to return my favorite string. And this whole thing returns a future. So you can see that the method returns immediately and the future is not completed here because this is asynchronous. Of course, it completes very quickly. It's a very simple Lambda. So if we take a look now, you can see that it is already completed. And if we try to extract the value from this future, you can see that it's indeed the value that we would expect. Now, these three constructs give us actually quite a sophisticated asynchronous system. I'm going to call this level one reactive. This goes beyond simple parallelization now. We actually have a synchronous computation, which is what reactive is all about, but features are still too low level of a construct and they're hard to compose. What you see in practice, when people are using futures, when they try to coordinate multiple tasks, they often do it by busy waiting. So you're essentially iterating over your task and you're checking, hey, is this done? Is this done? Is this done? And then when all the tasks that you need are done, you schedule the next task that depends on them. But that obviously wastes resources and makes you block on your main thread. On top of that, the get method that we used to get the value from the future is also a blocking call. So I can sort of run things asynchronously, but to get the result, I need to block. And being non-blocking is a core part of being reactive. From reactive perspective, it's important to avoid blocking threads because we want to optimize our use of CPU, but also avoid changing threads because contact switching is expensive. Essentially, the thread that we switch to generally uses different data from the previous thread. So the CPU needs to pull in the data and we want to optimize our use of cache because in general, the faster the cache, the smaller the capacity. That's how far your system needs to go to become reactive. And this really was made much easier with Java 7, which introduced the fork join framework, and most importantly, fork join pool. Fork join pool implements executor service. So it's a thread pool. And it's an ideal candidate for writing asynchronous systems because it understands that some tasks need to wait for others. It avoids changing threads if possible until workload is, is significant and it can help prevent cache corruption. So basically, it provides better utilization of resources and generally better performance for asynchronous processing. So how does it do it? Well, the key assumption behind it is that newly created tasks are more likely to have their data in a closer cache than older tasks. So maybe we should run those on our CPU and schedule old ones for other CPUs. And this is how it works. When I create a task, it goes in the queue. Every thread has a queue it needs to do. When the thread is ready, it says, hey, I'm ready. Do we have any tasks in the queue? And takes a task and executes it. When a task needs to do more work, it adds more tasks to the local thread queue. So the thread keeps pulling tasks from its local queue, which means ideally we're not corrupting our cache. So how do we scale this across threads? Well, if another thread is out of tasks, it does what's called work stealing, where it grabs a task from the bottom of someone else's queue. And the expectation is that the bottom of the queue is far enough from the cache that moving it to a different CPU will have the least performance impact. And it turns out that this works really well for asynchronous computations. We get good single-threaded performance, and as we're adding tasks, we get pretty good sharing across CPUs. In fact, the fork join pool works so well that it is what pretty much all other components relevant for reactive programming in Java use under the hood nowadays. If we wanted to use it directly, a very simple way of doing that is just by modifying the example from before. So if I go to my example here, all I need to change here is replace the single thread executor with a fork join pool. And so let's just use the common pool for simplicity. And then I can submit my task exactly like I did before, and I can extract the value exactly like I did before. Now, this of course is a very primitive way of using the fork join pool. I'm not really benefiting from it here, but it's just for demonstration purposes. So with futures, we're asynchronous. With the fork join pool, we can do asynchronous very effectively. And having really good performance for asynchronous programming is crucial for a reactive system. So I'm going to call this level two reactive. And this is a good level to be on, but there are still several building blocks that we'd have to build ourselves to program fully reactively on top of these constructs. The main problems that we have right now at this level are that futures are hard to compose and we're still blocking on the main thread. 
But as it turns out, Java 8 helps us with this quite a lot by introducing completable future. Completable future is basically a framework for primarily non-blocking asynchronous programming in Java. It's built around the class called completable future, which as the name suggests, is a future that may be explicitly completed so we can set its value and status. And when I say it's a future, I mean the class literally implements the future interface that we've just seen. It also implements another interface called completion stage, which was also introduced in Java 8. Completion stage is basically a representation of a stage in a computation. So essentially, we use completable future to model a task in a bigger, primarily asynchronous workflow, and we have APIs to create dependencies between tasks and chaining them. In other words, completable future addresses several problems that we have with futures. It makes tasks easy to compose, it allows us to do so in a non-blocking way, and it automatically uses the foreground pool behind the scenes, which performs very well. So how does it work? Well, the basic API is actually pretty simple. I can just create a new completable future here. Let's make it completable future of type string. And let's call this CF. And now I can complete this future with value, in our case, a string. So I'll just give it, let's say done. And now if I use the get method that we're familiar with from the future interface, you can see that it returns the value that I completed with. So what happens if I don't complete it? Well, let's try this. Let me just reinitialize my completable future here, and let's just call the get method directly. And you can see that nothing happens. Because remember, this is the standard blocking call from the future interface. So it's going to block until somebody else completes the future from a different thread. Aside from completing a future normally, I can also complete it exceptionally. So if I try to do that here, I can just call complete exceptionally, which needs a throwable. So let's just give it a new, let's say, illegal state exception. And now if I try to extract the value, you can see that it fails with the exception that I gave it. So that's the basic functionality. You can complete features normally and exceptionally. But so far, we're not really seeing benefits for reactive programming, are we? So what else can you do with this? Well, quite a lot, actually. Completable Future is a big class. It's almost 3,000 lines of code and quite a few methods, quite a few public ones, too. If we take a look here, you can see a bunch of them. If I remember correctly, there are 52 methods plus overloading. A few of them come from the Future interface, as we've seen, but the vast majority come from the Completion Stage interface, which has a whopping 38 methods. So yes, maybe not the best design, but it's actually not as bad as you might think. There's a system to these. The reason we have so many methods is because there are essentially three categories of what we want to express in the API. And we need to express sort of all the possible combinations across these three categories, which gives us 36 methods. The three categories are what, what kind of a task it is, how, how do I process it, what kind of an operation it supports, and where, what threat can it execute on. As for the task, there are three types. It can be a runnable, it can be a consumer, or it can be a function, which map to the corresponding Java interfaces. As for the operation, we can chain them, sort of execute one after another. We can compose them, as in function composition, and we can combine two of them using either AND or OR. And as for the thread it can run on, it can run in the same executor as the caller, it can run in a new executor, passed as a parameter, or it can run in the common fork join pool. So for example, and let's take a bit of a more realistic example. I'm going to create the futures in a different way and do everything asynchronously in a single pipeline, which is how we normally see this done. So I'm going to start by creating a new completable future. And I'm going to create it by using this method supply async. So the name of the method really tells me, you know, everything that's going on with respect to these three categories. It tells me that I'm going to need a supplier to generate my task. And I'm going to do it asynchronously, so not in the caller's thread, but either as an executor given as a parameter, or I will let the foregen pool decide. So let's create a simple supplier here, and I'm just going to create something like this, and let's use our favorite string, hello. Now I'm going to chain Ethernet onto it, and I'm going to call then apply async. Again, the name tells me everything. 
then tells me that the operation is basic chaining, apply tells me that my task is a function, and async, we've already discussed, I'll just use the fork gen pool here. So to give it a function, I'm just going to do something really simple to my string. Let's just append another string to it, j4k here. I'm going to continue with the pipeline. I'm going to call then accept async. Then accept async. Again, the name tells me everything. It tells me I'm chaining again as an operation. It expects a consumer as the type of my task. And again, it's done asynchronously. So I'm just going to give it a very simple consumer here. Just a quick method reference. Let's just print this out. And you can see that it works and it indeed prints the string that we were expecting. So we understand now what the system is, right? Why we have so many methods and how the naming works. This is sort of the basic pattern that we use with composable futures. It's a synchronous sequencing. So it's basically about creating that really basic dependency, ensuring that one task runs after another. But it also shows a key property of the completable future API. Almost anything that you do to a completable future produces another completable future, which gives you this nice fluent functional API to monitor your workflows. And we've really just seen the basics. You can actually do a lot with this. So I'll call this whole completable future system level three reactive. Completable futures get us very far. You could absolutely build a reactive system on top of them. And they address a bunch of issues that we had with futures. We can compose them easily, and we don't have to block on the main thread to coordinate, right? We can just tell it to run a dependent task when our task is done. And notice that we didn't see any executor services, threat and management, or anything like that. All this is hidden and abstracted from. So while a completable future is still a relatively low-level primitive, it's not that low-level. It's actually quite usable for reactive. But there's still a lot of stuff you'd want to build yourself on top of it. So what are we missing here? Well. So far, we've been executing workflows on individual objects, pieces of data. It would be nice if we could handle live data or streams of data as it's coming in. And if you started implementing that with completable futures, you would quickly realize that problems may arise. For example, your producer might be faster than the consumer and you need to deal with that. So we can either you know, drop the data, which is not great, or we can buffer it, but buffers will eventually fill up and you need to handle that or you can block, which is not very effective and not reactive. Or you could implement some sort of a communication model between the producer and the consumer or a back pressure mechanism. And this brings us to reactive streams. Reactive streams are a de facto standard for asynchronous stream processing with non-blocking back pressure. The concept of back pressure really comes from the metaphor of a valve at the end of a water pipe. Closing the valve increases the pressure back to the source while easing the burden on the destination. And this back pressure is an integral part of the reactive streams model because it allows our message queues to be bounded. And that's very important when you have finite resources. Java supports reactive streams through the Flow API introduced in Java 9. And the Flow API consists of two classes. There's a class Flow and there's a class Submission Publisher. The class Flow contains four nested static interfaces. You have a publisher who produces data you have a subscriber who receives data from the publisher. You have a subscription, which is the link between a publisher and a subscriber. This is what's used to implement back pressure. And you have a processor, which is a combination of a publisher and a subscriber. So it's something that sits in the middle of your flow and transforms data on the way. The other class here, submission publisher, is basically a reference implementation of the publisher interface in the flow class. So let's implement the simplest possible flow in which we have a single publisher publishing messages and a simple subscriber consuming messages as they arrive one at a time. So let's start with the subscriber here. I'm going to create a new class. I'm going to call it simple subscriber and it's going to implement the subscriber interface. Let's make it subscriber of type string. So the messages are going to be strings. And now I'm going to implement all the methods prescribed by this interface. There are four of these, and the first one is the method called onSubscribe. So I'm going to make public void onSubscribe, which takes a subscription, and let's just leave it empty for now. 
So the unsubscribe method is called at the beginning, before the processing starts, before any other subscriber methods for the given subscription are invoked. It receives the subscription, which is used to control the flow of messages between the publisher and the subscriber. So a subscriber can use this to make a request for new data to the publisher or request that the publisher doesn't send any more data. Then we have a method called onNext, so public void onNext, which receives a message, in our case a string, so let's just say it's this. This is the method that's called whenever the publisher publishes a new message. So you're probably noticing the naming pattern now, I'm basically implementing listeners on the subscriber side. We also have a method called onError, so public void onError, which takes a throwable, and this is basically for situations when you encounter an unrecoverable error either in the publisher or in the subscription. So it's for unrecoverable errors, so no other methods on the subscriber will be called after this. Similarly, we have a method called onComplete, so public void onComplete, which does not take any arguments. And this, again, is the last method that would be called on the subscriber, but in this case, in a successful scenario, so when the publisher is closed. Now, let's try to compile this and see if we've met the contract. And this is looking promising. This did actually compile. So let's now try to actually implement some body for these methods. So first of all, I'm going to need a subscription. So let's start with that. Let's just start by creating a private subscription here. Let's call it sub. Now, in unsubscribe, let's first start by setting the subscription. So this sub equals sub. And then I can use the subscription to request the first message here. So something like this. And let's also print out something to the output. Let's just print out that we have initialized. So I'm just going to say subscribed. And that should be it. So the subscription actually has two methods. There's a method request, which takes along. And this adds data to the current unfulfilled demand for the subscription. So if I give it a positive number, the subscriber then receives up to this number of additional on next calls. Up to because the producer might terminate in the meantime. If the argument is zero or less, the subscriber's on error method is called with an illegal argument exception. And if you pass it max value, as in long max value, it indicates an unbounded number of invocations. So this is the implementation of back pressure. The other method here is the method cancel, which causes the subscriber to eventually stop receiving data. This is an asynchronous system, so it's best effort. So you might receive something after you call cancel, but eventually the messages will stop coming. In on next, let's just print the message that we've received. So if I just go here, I'll just add a simple printout system out print line. And I'm going to say, okay, we've received a message. And let's also print out this message here. And then I'm going to use the subscription to request the next message. So just one message here. In on error, let's implement the best possible error handling, which as we all know, is something like this. In uh, uncomplete, I'm going to clean up. In this case, I don't have any resources open, so I'm just going to print that we're done. System out print line done. And that should be good. So let's try and save this. And we can see that this did compile, which is a very good start. So let's try to actually create an instance of our subscriber. And let's call this sub. And you can see that this worked as well. All right, so we have a simple subscriber. Let's create a publisher. And this will be much easier because the JDK already provides the submission publisher class as a possible implementation. To be fair, it's kind of meant as a base implementation for a publisher that you might need, but it actually provides everything we need for this simple use case. So I'm just going to obtain a new instance here. Let's call the new submission publisher. Let's make it of type string so that they can communicate. And let's call this pub. Now, the publisher has a few methods, but the interface only prescribes one, which is the method subscribe. And that method registers the subscriber with our publisher. So let's try to give it our subscriber here and let's see if that worked. 
And you can already see, we see a message from unsubscribe on our subscriber. So this indeed did go through. So one thing to note here about this behavior, when you type this, you know, the subscribers unsubscribe method is invoked with a new subscription object as we've seen. But if a subscriber is already registered or the registration fails due to some policy or other violation, this method actually invokes the onError method with an illegal state exception object again. And a null pointer exception is thrown when null is passed to the subscriber. We can check that the registration was indeed successful on the publisher here. I can obtain the list of current subscribers and we can see that we have one here. And now I should be able to use the publisher to submit a message and you, let's use our favorite string again, hello j4k, and you can see that the message was sent, but also received on the subscriber. And I can keep doing that. This is very reliable, of course, until finally I decide to close my publisher and we can see that the subscriber closed as well. And now, of course, if I try to post another message, it won't go through because the channel is already closed. So, this gives us a simple reactive streams publish subscribe system, but it's actually more sophisticated than it might seem, particularly because the built-in publisher is actually pretty smart. It uses fork join pool underneath for a synchronous delivery to subscribers. It uses completable futures. It provides some buffering, error handling, and things like that. So it is actually pretty good. Having said that, you should never implement your reactive system like this. What we have in Java right now is an SPI. It's not something that's meant to be implemented by application developers. It's something that's meant to be implemented by people developing reactive frameworks. So don't do this yourself, use the library. But I am going to call this level four reactive because we're actually pretty close to a fully working reactive model, but not quite there because we don't have the implementation in the JDK. So where can we go from here? Well, all this is great for passing messages between threads in the context of a single JVM, but the true reactive system needs to be resilient and consists of multiple services typically communicating over HTTP. Which brings us to Java 11 and its newly introduced HTTP2 client. Now this new API replaces the old HTTP URL connection API and it supports all the cool new things. It supports WebSocket, it supports HTTP2, including TLS, server push, proxies, cookies, basic authentication, basically everything that you would expect from a mature HTTP client. Now, to show the functionality of the client, I'm going to need a server. So I'll just create a simple local server here. In fact, I'm going to create the simplest possible server. It's just going to have a single endpoint, and no matter what kind of request I send to this endpoint, it's going to respond with fixed string. I actually really like this example because I think people often don't realize that we have this kind of functionality in the JDK. And this isn't even a new API. This has been around for a very long time. So I'm going to start by creating the handler for my endpoint. So HTTP handler, and let's call this handler. And this will take an HTTP exchange and do a quick Lambda here. Actually, it's going to be a multi-line Lambda, so not so quick, but it will do for example. And let's start by declaring the string that I want to return in the body of my response. So let's call it body. And I'm going to use our favorite string here, hello j4k. Now I'm going to use this HTTP exchange to set the response headers and I'm always going to respond with 200, everything is okay, and the length of my content is going to be the length of my string here. And now finally, I should be able to write the string to the response for which I'm going to need an output stream. So I'm going to create an output stream, attach my response body to it, and finally, I should be able to use the output stream to write my string to the response. And of course, this is just a bare output stream, so I need to first convert my string to bytes, but no problem here, and hopefully this works. All right, so we have a handler. We can now continue with the server. So I'm going to create a new HTTP server here, HTTP server create, and this needs a port. So let's give it a new port here. Let's say 8,000 and they'll need the backlog and let's call this hs. Now I should be able to create my endpoint. So let's say slash hello and attach my favorite handler to it. And finally, I should be able to start the server. Now, hopefully the server is working, but to test it, I'm going to need a client. So let's build a new one using the new HTTP2 client API. Now this new API is built around three main classes. There's HTTP client, HTTP request, and HTTP response.
let's start with the client here. HTTP client, I'm going to create a new one and let's call this a client. Now we can take a look here at the version and you can see that it indeed supports HTTP2. Now, to be fair, I'm not really taking advantage of this in my very simple example, but the functionality is there. Now I'm going to create the HTTP request, which actually uses the builder pattern. So I'm going to obtain a new builder here and it needs a URI, URI pointing to my local server. So I'll create a new one here and this should be something like HTTP uh, localhost, I think I used 8000 slash hello and let's make it a get request, doesn't really matter and let's build it and call this whole thing a request. And now finally I should be able to use my client to send the request to my server and this also needs something called body handler here. In this case I'm just going to tell it to treat everything as strings and we actually have a built-in handler for this so I'm just going to use this handler here and let's call this a response. And now the moment of truth has see, let's see if this is working. I can take a look at the status code first, 200. So this is looking promising. And now I can take a look at the body of my response and you can see that it's the exact string that we were expecting. So we have a working client and a working server here talking over HTTP. But this is a synchronous call over HTTP, which is not great for reactive. Thankfully, the client is actually really flexible. If I wanted to make this asynchronous, all I need to do is change this send to send async here, which now is going to return a completable future. Let's call this response. So if I wanted to use this in an asynchronous way, all I need to do is extract the value from the future and I can take a look at the body and you can see that it works just as before. So now we can do asynchronous calls over HTTP2 and use reactive streams and completable features on each end. In fact, the HTTP2 client uses the reactive streams model and completable features underneath. So this all ties together. So let's call this level five reactive. Now, should you build your reactive system using just these constructs? Well, no, that's actually still quite a lot of work, but this is what we have in the JDK right now. So what's next? How about some functionality from a future JDK? Well, you may have heard of Project Loom. Project Loom is experimental stuff, but a very, very high impact effort, which will quite substantially change how we do concurrency in Java. It's a Java effort, but it's not in the JDK yet. It isn't even planned for any soonish release as far as I know, but it is under heavy development and it has been under development since 2017. And really things are being changed constantly. The information that's out there often gets out of date pretty quickly, but here's what we know right now. Project Loom really tackles the topic of threats. If you remember, we started this session by talking about threads as sort of the base unit for concurrency in Java since its very first version almost 25 years ago. There was an excellent abstraction at the time and one that aged very well. We're still accomplishing amazing things with it and impressive scalability. In fact, some of the most scalable applications in the world are written in Java. However, over time, as the pressure to scale was growing, we've started to hit limitations of the standard concurrency model. First of all, Threads are inherently sequential, and that includes not just processing steps, but also blocking steps, like I.O. They are heavyweight because they're tied to operating system resources. When you create a thread, those resources have to be allocated as well. And even though threads exist as an abstraction so that we can better share scarce hardware resources, because they're so heavyweight and the level of scale our applications achieve nowadays is so vast, threads themselves have become a scarce resource. In fact, if you think about the levels of reactive that we've talked about so far today, many of them are essentially workarounds around this issue. Executor services and fork join pool are for sharing existing threads. Completable futures are for asynchronous computation to avoid blocking these existing threads. So we're sort of gradually sacrificing this familiar maintainable model of threads to achieve scale. And it would be nice if we didn't have to make the trade-off, if we could have both efficiency and easy to understand concurrency model. And that's exactly what Project Loom is trying to do. Project Loom does this by introducing the concept of virtual threads, formerly known as fibers. Virtual threads are lightweight threads which are inexpensive to create and block. They are managed by the Java runtime and implemented in user space, unlike regular threads which wrap operating system threads. 
So what you're getting by having Java manage them is a lot of efficiency thanks to the additional knowledge that Java has. For the OS, a thread is more of a black box, essentially. The OS doesn't know what kind of workload the thread is executing, what language it's written in, and how the language manages the stack. So the OS must go for a very conservative and robust approach that gives you a good compromise across all the possible implementations. But if Java manages its own threads, it knows a lot more about what they do. So it can basically represent them in a much more compact way and also adjust the scheduling accordingly. So virtual threads are not wrappers around operating system threads. They're just Java entities. How do we use these virtual threads? Well, pretty much like regular threads. Compatibility was a big design goal with Project Loom, and all the tools and libraries that can use threads will be able to use virtual threads as well. There aren't many new concepts. It's more about having new conventions for using existing concepts. Virtual threads are threads. So to create them, I'm going to start with a thread class that we've already seen today. Unlike regular threads, there is no public or protected constructor for virtual ones, so as not to have to deal with subclasses. So instead, I'm going to call a method here. And the method is start virtual thread. Unsurprisingly, this needs a runnable. So I'm just going to use one that I used before. System out frame line. Hello, J4K. And let's try this out. You can see that this works and it printed the correct result. So it really did create and execute a virtual thread. We have the output right here. We don't have to start threads directly. If we want more flexibility, there's a builder as well. So I can call thread builder. Then I can make a virtual thread, give it a task like a runnable from before. So again, let's just print out system out print line. Hello, J4K. And let's call build. And let's call this T. Now, we can check if this thread is actually virtual. Of course it is. And then we can start the thread. We can also use executor services, like we did with regular threads. In fact, I can completely reuse the example that I had before. I'm just going to start with executors. And instead of creating a single threaded executor, I'm going to create a new virtual thread executor and call this E. Now, this is a new executor from Project Loom. Since with virtual threads, we don't really need any sophisticated constructs like thread pools. It's actually a very simple one. It basically just creates a new virtual thread for each task. I can use this executor to submit a task. And in this case, it needs a callable. So again, I'm going to use the same one as before. Hello, J4K. And this returns a future. And then I can use the get method on the future to extract the value. Now, the thing to notice here is that this example is exactly the same as what we did when we talked about level one reactive. The only difference is the executor I'm giving it. So very easy sort of drop and replace functionality here. Now, virtual threads allow us to achieve pretty impressive efficiency. Creating virtual threads is cheap. You can have millions of them without the need for thread pools. And blocking it is also cheap. You don't need the more complicated asynchronous programming in many cases. You can just be synchronous. And if you want the flexibility of asynchronous programming, you can make it work with virtual threads for pluggable schedulers as well. So let's call this level six reactive. At this level, we have highly efficient virtual threads, which allow us to replace some of the more complicated constructs in a reactive stack, thus improving our ability to maintain, debug, and profile our reactive code. It should be noted that this doesn't replace reactive as a whole. The core of reactive is the communication model, reactive streams of back pressure, and Reactive is particularly powerful when you're scaling, not in the context of a single JVM, right? It's not just about packing many things on a single server, but when you're scaling your services, your application across many servers. So it will be interesting to see how Reactive systems will take advantage of this construct when it becomes available as part of the JDK, hopefully in a couple of years. So what should you do now? What is Reactive beyond level six in today's world? Well. There are a couple of things missing in the Reactive Streams API in Java that you would most likely need in a real life system. Operators, even really simple ones like map or filter, dealing with cycles, restarting, monitoring, tracing, concurrency modeling, buffering strategies. All this is hard to implement yourself. But thankfully, there are libraries and systems out there that do this for us. So I would say that level seven Reactive is using a proper Reactive Streams library. And there are a few good ones for Java. The most well-known ones are RxJava and Reactor, 
both really good choices, very mature, widely used in production and supported by large companies. And they do a very good job in the context of a single JVM when you're passing things between threads and such. But if you want to go beyond that into a truly distributed system with microservices, you might want more. You might want to use a higher level framework incorporating these libraries. So I would say that's level eight reactive, using something like Vertex, which uses ArxJava in the background, or Spring 5, which uses Project Reactor by default. Or maybe you connect your services over something better than direct HTTP calls, maybe a distributed streaming system like Kafka. But you can see that there is a clear trend with reactive programming in Java. Over the years, more and more things have moved away from reactive developers to the JDK, and we can expect this trend to continue, like with Project Loom. We're currently at level five reactive with the JDK, which means that we're actually pretty far down the road. Many useful building blocks are already in place, but it's mostly relatively low-level constructs you shouldn't use or implement directly. As an application developer right now, you're better off relying on a higher-level framework to help you there. There are many things out there to choose from. They all come with baggage, so just be careful about choosing the kind of baggage that you want to bring with you. And that's it for me. I hope you found this talk useful. If you want to get in touch, here's my Twitter handle in the corner here. And otherwise, thank you and enjoy the rest of the conference.